we are not like any other group of believers. We don't try to follow along with the, uh, uh, the rest of the world when it comes to marriages or anything else. Uh, we don't do a ceremony like theirs. If they have something to say, they can say it. Uh, I will say what I want to say. And, uh, but we're, we've come here this afternoon to join Jason and Summer. I put up here JC and SS. It looks like Jesus Christ and the and the uh, Hitler's Hitler's SS. <laughs> uh, but we are here to join Jason and Summer. Summer Summers, what a name! <laughs> We're here to join Summer and Jason and Summer in the holy estate of matrimony. And I have a mini message. I hope I can make it mini. M I N I. And I, there's some things, I, I'm going to do things different in this marriage ceremony, that ceremony that, I, that I've ever done. When I begin to, to have a predestination ceremony, it gave me a thrill to be able to have a wedding and have a predestination funeral. A time to live, a time to die, not going to God ordaining all things. And that's what the wedding and the funeral is about. It's, the, it's a picture of Christ in the church. Jesus being the bridegroom and the church being the wife or the bride. And uh, in Genesis 2, 18, 21, 23, the scripture says the Lord said it is not good that man should be alone. Uh, I'll make him a help, meet for him. It means someone who's worthy of him is going to help him. And God caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam and... Uh, he took one of Adam's ribs and he made a woman. And Adam said, now this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh because it actually came out of his side. And marriage is, is a picture of Christ in the church. And the word wife was meant the church. Whenever the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 and 2 that Christ is the head of of every man in the church. It says every man. It means every man in the church. He's the head. Therefore, if he's the head, then the church has to be the body. Well, he says that repeatedly that uh, there in Colossians 1, 18 and 24, that the body is the church or the wife. That's what the body is. Christ is the head. The head gives instruction and protects the body. And uh, the wife was called out of her house to go to her bridegroom's father's house after a period of time. And I'm going to use the board while I'm doing this this time so people can see what this is about as we go along the way. She was called out of her father's house into the house of the father of the bridegroom. And before this happened, there were certain arrangements uh, that were made and these before she was called out in fact the word the word church and wife are synonymous because church is the word ecclesia e-k-k-l-e-s-i-a that is the word church and this is actually what happened to the wife ek meaning out and kaleo which means called. And I want to show you this in a minute so we can see this more clearly. The wife was called out of her house. The church means called out. Now, the, before this happened, there were arrangements made concerning the wife. And the wife was the ancient equivalent term of fiancé. That's what the word wife was. Before they were married... In a Jewish household, during the time of the betrothal for a year, she was called wife. The night she was taken out, she was called bride, and she was called bride from then on. This is, was the man's bride. Every day of his life, he'd refer to her as his bride, not his wife. But wife was just as, just as much a bond to the husband during that contract period as the bride was. There was a period of a year 
a year. In one year, that time period during the betrothal, during the betrothal, she was called wife, and she was bought and paid for by the father of the bridegroom, of the bridegroom, and he had a friend. And in this case, it was the Holy Spirit. And he took his friend and went out and arranged to find a wife, a particular specific wife for his son. And he would go and get that woman, and she didn't even know who her husband was going to be. And she was bought and paid for, and paid for by the father of the bridegroom with an arrangement of the friend and she was given to the son or to the bridegroom. This is why Jesus says those words over in John 17, bridegroom. She was given to the bridegroom before she ever met him, before she ever knew him. She was given to him. And Jesus said, my father gave you to me. And he says in, in John 17, I'm just going to take some time to do this because this is what the marriage is about. In John 17, he says there, at the beginning of the chapter, he says, in verse 2, he says, uh, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And that's referring to the wife. That's what he's referring to. And he goes on down, he says in verse 9, I pray not for, I pray not for them, I pray not for the world. I pray for them, but I pray not for the world. For, for, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. He's talking about the wife, the church. This is what he's talking about. All this is about predestination. And she would be, she would be, she, I, well, do what you have to do, but we, I'm have to do this right now. We can do that later, okay? And then during that time period, she was called wife. He would come and meet her. And Jesus came and met his wife, the church. And we use a, a verse over in John 14, 1. And people use it at funerals. It's not a funeral verse. It's a wedding verse. When he would come, he would come to his wife and say, I'm fixing to leave and go to my father's house. He lives over here. He has a big house. I'm going to go to my father's house, but let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in my father, believe also in me. In my father's house are many, it doesn't say mansions, it says rooms. Now this is metaphoric speech. We know it's not literal rooms, and it's not literal mansions, and it's not a literal place. It's someplace spirits that we, don't, we can't conceive. Well, he would leave her and he would go over to his father's house for a year and leave her there. He would leave her there. And he would go to her house and he'd build a room on his father's house. Then when he would build this room, he would go back a year later after he had met her and talked to her and said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in my father, believe also in me. My father's promised you to me. He's given you to me and arranged this. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, wife. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again a year later and I will receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. And this wasn't just any wife running down the street. It wasn't any woman. It was a particular, specific, predestinated Planned, chosen wife. That's what predestination's about. There were steps made to take care of this. There was a prearranged bride. That's why the scripture, it's prearranged. There was a foreknowing. When the Bible says, whom he did foreknow. Foreknow has the idea of knowing someone as a wife, a son, a daughter, a husband, so God foreknew his family, who they were, and he says, 
I have bought you before the world began. Jesus was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. There was a dowry paid for this woman. There was a dowry. The reason for the dowry wasn't just so she could have lots of presents or whatever. The reason for the dowry, she was going to reduce this household of her father's house. She's going to reduce this household from then on when she grew up she come to marriage age, she's going to reduce the workforce, the household, and go live with her husband's family. And that's why the Jewish family would weep when a daughter was born. It wasn't because she was less than a man. If anything, it was, uh, it was a tribute to her. They wept when daughters were born because they knew they were going to lose her one day. They knew that. And they said, we will one day lose her. So she was given a dowry. She was bought and paid for. And the way we were bought and paid for, in that last verse of the sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians, the Bible says, you are not your own. You're bought with a price. You can't live the way you want. And we have to live holy. And she had to be clothed in white in white, when he came to get her. He would come to get her at midnight, at midnight, a year later. Everyone knew he was coming, but he was said to be coming as a thief, a thief in the night. Well, she had to be clothed in white, and anyone who was in the marriage party had to have two things. They had to be clothed in white, and they had to have a lamp with oil. They had to have a lamp with oil. And when they, when they got over to the father's house, he would come, and he would come outside the house and call her out to him. I'm here. Come out to me. He's calling her out, Ecclesia. He'd call her out. She would go out to meet him. That's what the ten virgins are about in Matthew 25, starting in verse 1. The five wise and the five foolish virgins. Oil is always a picture of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is truth. And thy word is truth. And if you don't have the truth, you don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have the word of God, and you cannot go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You can't go. In fact, they had something equivalent of not being able to stay in the marriage supper of the Lamb. They would go, the party would go. They would leave the house of the bridegroom's father, uh, mother, uh, excuse me, the wife's father. And they would go over here, and they would go in, and they had a feast, a marriage feast. When you see marriage feast, or you see feast, it's usually referring, even there in Luke 14, preparing a marriage feast, and some begin to make excuse. It's talking about the marriage of Christ. That's the whole context of Luke 14. That's when the scripture says, some begin to make excuse and say, I can't eat of this feast. I bought a plot of ground and I can't go to church on Sunday morning. I can't go to Grace and Truth Ministries. My family won't like it if I tell them Christmas is pagan and predestination is true. They won't like this. I can't. Another them made an excuse. He said, I married a wife and she won't let me go to Grace and Truth. She won't let me believe these truths about predestination. She won't let me believe truths about Christmas being pagan. That's, that is the context of Luke 14, is the marriage supper. That's what it's about. Well, when they would get over here, they'd get over to the, the bridegroom's house. When they got there, they would go in and begin to feast.